Are there any questions? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question today is to the Attorney General. Attorney General, I refer to paragraph 5 of the uh, summary of the second summary of this uh, report 61 of the Standing Committee on Procedures and Privileges of the Legislative Council. Uh, and I quote from it saying that uh, in paragraph 5, quite simply, it's the PPC's view that at the heart of this matter is an entirely inexplicable sudden cessation of good faith negotiations between the PPC and the Commissioner of the Triple C. This coincided with the bold usurpation of the powers and privileges of the Legislative Council through the calculated intervention of the Attorney General and the State Solicitor's Office. And I ask, have you compromised the, legit the integrity of the Triple C by intervening in a Triple C process? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I just missed very much. I'll repeat. So Thank you. I missed it. I'll repeat. The, just um, maybe just a little more slowly and. Okay. Uh, it seemed to me a, a quite a long preamble, but if you can, I don't know if that can be uh, abbreviated at all, but if we can just make the questions okay, well, to I'll the Attorney the, General I'll, clear. I'll just, I'm quoting yep. here paragraph 5 of the executive summary of this report 61, uh, and it reads quite simply, it is the PPC's view that at the heart of this matter is an entirely inexplicable sudden cessation of good faith negotiations between the PPC and the Commissioner of the Triple C. This coincided with the bold usurpation of the powers and privileges of the Legislative Council through the calculated intervention of the Attorney General and State Solicitor's Office. And I ask, have you compromised the integrity of the Triple C by intervening in this process? The Attorney General, and just um, I know that you will be cognizant of anything that might be sub judice, but if you could just keep that in mind. I'll keep it in mind and keep it brief. No, I haven't. A supplementary question. The, the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party, oh, sorry, the National Party. Yeah. So, Attorney General, do you concede that by your actions that you have been undermining the rights of the Procedures and Privileges Committee of the other place? Attorney General. No, I do not. The member for, I'm going to say. Long, long question, short answer. My question is to the Premier. <laughs> I refer to the state government's strong response to COVID-19 that's protected the health of West Australians and delivered a world-leading economy. And I ask, can the Premier update the House on what the return to pre-lockdown conditions will mean for West Australians, including West Australian business? And can the Premier advise the House how this snapback will help continue to drive the WA economy? The Thank you to the member for Mira Booker for her first question, and can I congratulate her on her uh, significant victory in the electorate of Mira Booker at this state election. Um, I announced a few moments ago that on Saturday Perth and Peel will return to pre-lockdown life. Uh, this snapback is only possible because of the good and hard work of all uh, West Australians and because people have listened uh, to the health advice. Uh, since Saturday, May the 1st, uh, there have been no new community cases of COVID-19, despite 101,000 tests being undertaken since the 25th of April. So based on the health advice, as of uh, midnight this Friday or 12.01 this Saturday morning, uh, this will mean masks are no longer mandatory except at the airport, no capacity limits of weddings or funerals. Uh, Events will be able to operate at 100% capacity. Visitor limits for patients in hospitals, aged care or disability facilities uh, will be lifted and limits on home gatherings of 100 will be lifted. Uh, and uh, that will allow for um, people to go back to life as we knew it uh, prior to uh, lockdown over uh, the uh, Anzac Day uh, long weekend. Uh, the, uh, it's very important, however, that people continue to use the Safe WA app uh, or written contact register, uh, and allow, that allows our contact tracers uh, to do uh, their important work. Uh, of course, uh, Madam Speaker, um, Western Australia's amazing job uh, over this period has delivered a strong economy within our state with the lowest unemployment rate in the nation uh, and uh, the best financial management in the nation. Uh, and the federal budget that was released this week uh, was an endorsement of our COVID-19 management uh, strategy. Uh, the recent economic indicators uh, show the ABS weekly payroll data released this week showed that jobs over the fortnight two to the, two the 21st of April, just over the fortnight, increased by 0.1 of a percent. Uh, and uh, that was the first fortnight since the end of JobKeeper. 
uh, which showed growth in jobs despite the end uh, of uh, JobKeeper. Uh, and uh, also showed uh, that Western Australia has the strongest jobs recovery uh, of all uh, the states. And according to this metric, the number of jobs is 4.5 per cent above uh, pre-COVID levels, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker. And internet, um, internet job vacancies uh, were in April at the second highest level in nine years. In nine years. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, that reflects the confidence in our business community. It reflects consumer confidence. It reflects that uh, the economic, financial, and health uh, COVID management uh, of this government has created the strongest business, consumer, and economic conditions in Western Australia uh, since the height of the last boom, uh, despite large parts of the world going through significant economic contractions. And we've done this whilst maintaining the best financial management of any government in Australia. And indeed, state and cause indicates the best financial government management of any, of any government in the world. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to case number 2717 of 2019, currently before the Supreme Court, launched by the President of the Legislative Council against the Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission, and I ask, if it is found that the Commissioner acted unlawfully in issuing notices to the Director-General of the Department of Premier and Cabinet to produce privileged documents, will you continue with your support for the reappointment of Mr McKechnie as head of the Triple C? Question. The Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, understanding orders, me commenting mm. on a matter before the court and preempting its judgment uh, would be um, it's improper. Not preempting it. Uh, and that's what your question asked. No. So, uh, and I think that shows the inexperience of the Liberal Party. Premier, and can I provide further counsel to the Leader of the Liberal Party? Um, my understanding is that there are determinations before the court and that you are are likely infringing on sub judice uh, parts of the standing orders of this place. Premier. No, no. Premier, I was not asking you to comment on the court sorry, case. Sorry, I'm member, member. My supplementary when I give you the call for sorry, order please. When I give you the call for a supplementary question it is for that. It's not for you to engage in debate. Speaker, supplementary question. Premier, can you guarantee your government will not interfere with the completion of the important court case number 2717 of 2019 before the Supreme Court? No. I've asked for an answer. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the, question, the initial question asked by the Liberal, the Liberal Party was, if the court finds some judgment, uh, mm -hmm. what am I going to do and am I going to overrule some judgment of a court no, uh, with that. a number uh, and uh, a details that I'm unfamiliar with? Um, and so, Madam, Madam Speaker, the whole premise of this question is based upon a breach of the standing orders and somehow me interfering in some court case. Uh, and is it any wonder the member for Vass looks so embarrassed sitting next to you? <laughs> I'm hoping to give the next question. Sorry, right. Min Minister. Minister, we'd like the government member to be able to ask her question. Member for Bicton. Member for Armadale. My question is Order, to the please. Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to protecting the Belia wetlands and stop the destructive and grossly expensive Row 8 project. And I ask. Can the minister outline to the House how the state government will deliver on this important commitment and honour the overwhelming mandate it received at the last election from the people of Western Australia? The Minister for Transport. That's a very good question, Madam Speaker. Can I thank the member for Bigton for that question? And of course, we went to the 2017 election promising to stop the flawed Perth freight link and to save the Belia wetlands. And of course, we got elected and we delivered delivering the commitments we gave, planning for a new port at Quinana, moving more freight onto rail, upgrades to High Street and the development of intermodals. Madam Speaker, as I said, all those commitments are being delivered and we have protected and saved the Belia wetlands for future generations. We introduced specific legislation in the last term to protect and reserve the Belia wetlands 
it succeeded in this place but was fr frustrated in the other place. So again, in 2021, in January of this year, we took a commitment to the election, and that commitment was not to proceed with Row 89 and to save the Beelia wetlands. And yet again, we've introduced that legislation into this place. Yeah. Now, you thought the opposition would have moved on. You thought the Liberal Party would have moved on. But again, yesterday, protesting as if it was the first time they've ever heard about it. The member for Cottesloe, shocked and surprised about our commitment. So I went through again, I went through again, and I thought I'd go through some history again, members, because you know, I like going through history. So, I, so I, went through, I went through, and of course, the other side, the Liberal Party yet again, made it the centrepiece, or their second biggest election commitment, just behind the energy plan, <laughs> made it the centrepiece, the centrepiece of their election campaign. And, uh, uh, um, that's a good question. My favourite day was honk for row 89 day. <laughs> the honk for row 89 day. And I just went through to see who was in that honk for row 89 day picture. <laughs> So you've got the member for VAS who's still here, um, the puppet master of the Liberal Party, and of course the former leader of the opposition, the member for Dawesville. Let's go through all those Liberal candidates, member. So the Liberal candidate for Riverton, the Liberal candidate for Fremantle, the Liberal candidate for Jandicott, the Liberal candidate for Bigden, the Liberal candidate for Willoughby, and the Liberal ca candidate for Coburn. And what do they all have in common, members? <laughs> They're not here. They're not here. Not here. Not here. Not only did they not honk for row 89, they didn't vote for it either, members. <laughs> but yet again, it was good to see the member for Cottesloe go back to the 1960s, back to the 1960s to bring that old policy back. We've all moved on. We're saving the Beelia wetlands for future generations. We're planning our freight and trade future. We're planning for a new port. And what we're doing is making sure that we have a port for future generations and we save the Beelia wetlands for generations. That's a forward-thinking policy. We'll let them stick in the 1960s, where the member for Cottesloe feels very, very comfortable reducing their policies. And members, we're happy to take it to the next election. As I said last term, let's take it to the 2021 election. Happy to take it to the 2025 election, members. The uh, member for Vance. <laughs> My question Sorry. is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the expert panel report into the tragic death of Aishwarya Ashwath and your comments uh, last night in which you said the report made no findings about staff shortages on the night. And, uh, and I ask, given the report stated uncovered sick leave of medical staff resulted in a reduction in available medical staff during the evening, delays in medical assessments, prolonged waiting times and impeded the capacity for medical staff to provide more comprehensive response to parental escalation. How do you explain your comments? Minister for Madam Health. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I assume the member for VAS has now had the benefit, as have the Premier and I, of a briefing from the, the Chief Executive of Child and Adolescent Health Services, who provides a proper insight into the actual uh, actual report itself. And, and what that showed, and the Premier, I think, went into some detail uh, in the earlier debate, uh, the debate earlier today, into the configuration of staff on that day. And it's true that the report makes observations that, um, that on that particular occasion there were not, uh, a, there was not a shortage of staff. Now, and again, uh, reflecting on the, the comments from the Secretary of the ANF earlier today on radio, that doesn't mean there's not staffing issues. And these issues have been known to both the, the doctors and nurses on the floor and the leadership of, of Child and Adolescent Health Services. In fact, the leadership of pretty much every hospital in Australia at the moment, and that is demand has, has put significant pressure on our hospitals, and we need to respond to that demand both through our physical infrastructure but also through workforce and labour. And that's why, Madam Speaker, uh, since late last year, the leadership uh, at PCH was working with the doctors and nurses on how we can continue to grow the, grow the capacity of the hospital, particularly through increased staffing, to make sure that we can meet that demand as it continues to, um, continues to challenge the hospital. Uh, 
And that's and as as uh, I think it was the week before the incident involving Ashwarya, there are actual meetings between doctors in the ED and with the leaders leadership at the at PCH, which actually looked into this that were discussing the very measures which are which were needed to, to do that. Subsequent to these issues, of course, um, um, Madam Speaker, the, the uh, Australian Nurses Federation has written to me, uh, which uh, consolidating the concerns of uh, ED nursing staff with respect to uh, with respect to uh, uh, staffing levels and staffing configurations. And so, obviously, we've had the opportunity to complete the work which the PCH leadership was already undertaking. And I just want to take some time, Madam Speaker, to provide members with details on what that new staffing arrangements are. Uh, the strategies um, that, the, that the PCH uh, uh, leadership are implementing include an immediate increase in permanent nursing staff to enable two additional registered nurses rostered for the emergency department across all shifts, resulting in an increase of 11.1 .1 FTE. Increased allocation of leave provisions across the nursing establishment, enabling permanent recruitment of an additional five FTE, bringing total overall increase to 16.1 FTE. The increased FTE includes an additional nurse allocated to monitor patients in the emergency department waiting areas, an additional nurse allocated to work across the emergency department supporting areas with high levels of activity, introduction of rapid nurse recruitment and additional support for onboarding across PCH, including with enhanced graduate nursing capacity to optimise the permanent recruitment of, to the increased FTE, a designated ED resuscitation team, Madam Speaker, on every shift, supported by senior medical and nursing staff from within the hospital, attending every, resusc every resuscitation. An increase in the allocation of staff development nurses in the emergency department, effectively doubling the allocation. Increased uh, clinical nurse specialists to cover each day to provide supervision of junior nursing staff. The establishment of a medical short stay unit, on the, which was established on the 13th of April, to provide treatment for general paediatric patients with length of stay less than 72 hours to support timely admission, improved outcomes and improved emergency access, and the expansion of the surgical short stay ward to increase an in to support an increase in theatre sessions and emergency theatre access and activation of beds in our high dependency unit, which is currently being worked on. This, these, this, um, this work was detailed in a letter to the Secretary of the ANF, Madam Speaker, and I seek leave to, to table this letter for the benefit of members' uh, information. Pa paper tabled. So, so ma Madam Speaker, as the, as the Premier pointed out earlier uh, in in the earlier debate, uh, there were a, a good allocation of doctors and nurses working on that particular evening, and and obviously um, uh, we will continue to make sure we work with all the all the frontline staff to make sure that we uh, continue to support them the best way we can. Can I just conclude in saying, Madam Speaker, that this has been a horrible incident, a dreadful incident, and we continue uh, to um, extend our thoughts appreciation and apologies to the family impacted by Ashwari's passing. And can I also just place on the record my appreciation, admiration and respect for all our frontline staff, doctors and nurses, who do a difficult job on behalf of all of us, making difficult decisions every day in a complex, high-pressure environment. And I will do everything I can to make sure that they feel supported during these, this period as well. Supplementary. The member for Vass. Uh, given your response to the ANF, uh, do you now admit that Perth Children's Hospital has been chronically understaffed? And what is the timeline to implement the additional staffing and much needed resources? Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, no, I do not. Um, no, I do not. All our hospitals are, are facing uh, increased demand pressures at the moment, and this, as I've said before, is going on right across Australia, where we see an increase in volume, an increase in acuity, higher mental health presentations, and a higher level of of um, of uh, a cure of patients requiring emergency surgery. In particular, in relation to PCH, we've had an increase in demand around eating disorders in particular. It's putting the, the system under pressure. 
But as I said in my early remarks, this work has been ongoing for some time now, since late last year, once we saw that, that pattern of demand change. And that's what we expect from our leadership. We expect them to work with the doctors and nurses on the front line to make the decisions and the resourcing decisions necessary to make sure that we can continue to support them. As um, I, I've said in my earlier remarks, the advice that we have is on the evening uh, that staffing shortages was not a contributing factor in relation to this particular incident. But we do acknowledge that there continues to be staffing pressures, and that's why we've been undertaking this work over for some time now, Madam Speaker, and why we'll continue and why we will continue to do that work. The member for Swan Hills. My question is to the Minister for Energy. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to delivering cleaner and greener energy, diversifying our economy and supporting new sustainable job creating industries. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how the McGowan Labor government is responding to the imminent challenges facing WA's energy sector? And can the Minister outline how this response will help create new jobs for West Australians? Minister for Energy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to answer the question. I want to acknowledge the hard work that the member for Swan Hills did in the last parliament in chairing the uh, inquiry into microgrids and congratulate her on the insights that the, is assisting the government in our response to uh, rising uh, distributed energy resources in Western Australia. We, we are dedicated to making our electricity system cleaner, greener and ready for the future. The last 12 months we've seen 300 megawatts of additional rooftop solar put into the southwest interconnected system. To put that in scale, that compares to the largest single power station in Western Australia the Collie, uh, in the southwest system, the Collie Power Station, which is 340 megawatts. So basically an entirely new power station uh, paid for by mums and dads. And we want to make sure that that type of investment is at the heart of our uh, energy transformation. And I want to congratulate uh, Steve Edwell and the Energy Transformation Task Force, whose work is just about to be complete, for the, for the roadmap that they've provided to the government uh, to deal with these uh, changing uh, environment for energy in Western Australia and globally. And a key element of that strategy is our distributed energy resources roadmap, where we're trying to build distributed energy resources into the system, rather than having these, these uh, 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 installations as being additional to the system, we want to embed them so that the system can work with high levels of rooftop solar. Unlike the crazy plans of the member for Cottesloe, we want to have a sensible plan that rewards families for their investment into the system. And part of that, we've, uh, Western Power's installed 10 power banks. That's batteries embedded into the distribution network, a globally important piece of work that we're now uh, testing to see how, uh, what additional response we can get out of that. And those uh, embedded batteries will continue to be installed across the southwest in interconnected system. We're trialling a tariff that rewards people's energy consumption so that if they uh, consume electricity in a manner that supports the the, uh, the grid, they get rewarded for that. And it's pleasing to see that uh, the people on that trial, the 400 people on that trial, are responding very positively to the opportunity that they're being engaged with. We've got Project Symphony, which is about to, we hope, launch in the uh, uh, electorate of uh, Southern River, where we're going to bring together, uh, through uh, Western Power Energy Policy WA Synergy and uh, the Australian Energy Market Operator, plus a range of universities, uh, coordination of rooftop panels, uh, uh, behind the meter batteries, embedded batteries and appliances so that they can act as a virtual power plant to show that it's not just about increased supply but the use of demand to make sure we can manage the system. And that is a globally significant project that will be done here in Western Australia. And I want to congratulate everybody involved in that, uh, that uh, project. And finally, I just want to talk about standalone power systems. Western Australia is uniquely placed to take advantage of standalone power systems, and I'm pleased to say that, uh, the, that we launched a uh, second round of standalone power systems last year, all manufactured here in Western Australia. And during the election campaign, the Labor government committed to, in, to building 1,000 1, additional standalone power systems here in Western Australia. Western Australian manufacturing businesses are globally leading uh, on this technology. And I also want to let people know that uh, Horizon Power is in fact uh, investing directly in the manufacturing 
uh, of these uh, standalone power systems. And one of the uh, companies here in Western Australia is now a company called Boundary Power. And that is a joint venture between Horizon Power and Amp Control, a leading supplier of technological solutions uh, to the energy sector globally. And so uh, Boundary Power is now a, a, a JV that will be manufacturing here in Western Australia to support the rollout of standalone power systems. And so they'll be delivering uh, 17 SPSs uh, uh, on the edge of grid um, over the next uh, period of time. And it's an exciting opportunity. So here in Western Australia, we have technology that is leading the globe and we're trying to support those, those businesses to export to the world, export their technology to other parts of, West, of Australia. And exactly as being recommended by you, Member for Swan Hills, in your excellent report that you did for the last parliament. So the good news is that the Labor government, the McGowan Labor government is committed to a greener energy future and we want to make sure that those technologies are being developed here in Western Australia. The member for Vass. Um, my question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the SARC-1 clinical incident investigation report into the tragic death of Ashwarya As Aswath and ask why has the government given itself six months to implement these recommendations and why isn't it acting with more urgency given the potentially dire outcomes in delaying their implementation? The Minister for Health. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, we are moving swiftly to appoint uh, the, the independent uh, 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 review. Uh, the Director General of Health has already spoken to the Australian Safety and Quality Commission to get their advice in relation to what should be considered. Uh, but most importantly of all, we committed to working with Ashwari's family in relation to uh, in, in relation to the issues that they want to see inquired into. It won't stop us from implementing uh, uh, changes straight away, and many changes would have already been made. Uh, but we want to make sure that it's a comprehensive review, uh, that it benefits from the collective wisdom of all those working on the front line, but most importantly of all, uh, provides uh, further answers and um, resolution for Ashwari's family. Supplementary. Supplementary, <coughs> uh, Member uh, for uh, Minister, if it takes six months to implement these recommendations, what confidence can the people of WA have in the system in the meantime? Minister for Health. Well, Member, if you'd listen to my first answer, my answer, which was that uh, the, we will not wait for the six months to implement uh, the, the review, and it will be an ongoing iterative process which will uh, clearly feed from the, the experience of others. You should listen to the answers in the same way we'd hope that you'd listen to the briefing you were given in relation to this matter. The Member for Belcada. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Culture and the Arts. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to supporting the Western Australian art and events community uh, industry, particularly through the COVID-19 pandemic. And I ask, can the minister outline to the House what this government's significant, significant support has meant for businesses and jobs in Western Australia's arts and events sector? Oh, yes, I can. The Minister for the Arts. Yes, I can, and I'm very pleased to. And I want to acknowledge the member for Balcatta, a, a, a fine uh, man of culture <laughs> and a fine patron of the arts. He's a magnificent member, and I congratulate you on your re-election, member for Balcatta, because I know you're very highly regarded by your community, as you are in this place. Um, great question, because it is important to highlight to the House that um, the uh, impact of COVID-19, as we know, has had a huge impact on a whole range of uh, industry, uh, industry uh, sectors, including, of course, uh, the, uh, the arts and entertainment industries. But I do want to highlight very clearly to the House that uh, this government has uh, uh, initiated a number of programs that have ensured that our artists keep on creating their art, that our uh, performers keep on performing. Uh, that our uh, people involved in the entertainment industry and the events industry continue to uh, be able to participate and put on uh, great shows, great festivals, great, great events. We have been focused on that, uh, despite the challenges that have been faced by, by COVID-19. Now, what we also know is that we've had some programs that have been implemented through the investment by the McGowan government in uh, our recovery programs. And one of those is the Get the Show on the Road. 
a focused program of $15 million focusing on supporting uh, the entertainment industry, the performing arts industry, the music industry, so that they can uh, continue to, uh, with, with, some, with confidence, put on events uh, and put on uh, uh, stage shows, uh, even though we've had, of course, the threats of, of, of uh, uh, the, um, the COVID-19 experience. Now, the, I've got to tell you about this uh, Get the Show on the Road because it has had been a very important investment that other states and territories have actually looked at as, as themselves as copying. What it's done is allow uh, 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 the government to uh, underwrite, if you like, uh, events so that if they uh, do not, if they are, are impacted by change uh, or, or change circumstances, uh, that there is a floor support there for them. And that has allowed many, many events to take place despite the pressures of the, of the... And I want to go through them, because there's a number of them. Because we did hear earlier this week, Madam Speaker, we heard the opposition sort of highlight that, 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 that the, uh, the, the entertainment industry had stopped in Western Australia. It hasn't. It hasn't. It is, it is continuing to deliver a, ma a magnificent... Um, it is continuing to deliver... I say, Minister for the Arts, you, you and the Minister for Transport have ensured that the transport... the, the uh, arts industry has kept going and the entertainment industry uh, has not stopped. Absolutely. And I'm glad you're with me. I'm glad you're with me, Madam Speaker. I'm glad you're with me. We could be a double act now. Can I tell you this? There's been some, some significant events over the period of the last 12 months, including during the times when we had some significant pressures on the entertainment industry. We've had Zachariah concerts, touring uh, aid events, Castaway, Birds of Tokyo, Who, who Do Gurus, Missy Higgins, Ber uh, Bernie Dirch's Berlin Underwood. We've seen Missy Higgins, Good Bad Day Sunshine, the Black State Theatre Company, continue to, to uh, deliver three events, uh, including, um, including Oklahoma, the Cherry Orchard and Play Things. I went to the Cherry Orchard. It was very good. Uh, well, so, uh, six events, including Birds of Tokyo, Ben Folds and the Classic Series, the Fairbridge Festival continued. There were uh, over 45 uh, individual other events that were, have been supported through this initiative. What does it show, Madam Speaker? It shows that our entertainment industry in Western Australia is in very good shape. And I want to pay tribute to those artists, artisans, musicians, producers, the people who work behind the scenes, the people who work on the stage, those people who have been so stoic and under great deal of pressure, I must say, but they have continued to be focused on delivering high-quality entertainment opportunities to the West Australian public. And it is high quality. Why? Because we now know that during this period in the last 12 months, so many of our creative industry people have been honing, honing their creative talents. And when we are able to uh, welcome our, uh, our welcome uh, audiences from, uh, obviously, interstate and internationally, they will be uh, served uh, a whole range of cultural opportunities, which, of course, will be a huge boost to tourism, huge boost to our visitor economy, and a huge boost to the psyche of Western Australia, delivering, as we know, to a place that now is not only one of the safest in the world, but of course is also has one of the strongest economies in the world. That's what we've been doing and we'll keep doing it because we recognise that the creative industries play a critical role in the narrative of a diversified economy and the narrative of a vibrant Western Australia. The member for Rome. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, will, will you ensure that the independent external review into the Perth Children's Hospital Emergency Department includes specific investigation into the tragic death of Ashwarya Aswath and the 20 other SAC-1 events since January 2020, and that the terms of reference are made public and open for comment before commencing the review? Minister for Health. Uh, I thank the member for the question. If he'd listened to my previous answer, he might um, have had a greater clarity uh, in relation to this. Uh, yes, uh, we will look into all the matters which impact in relation to the, op the operation of the ED, in particular the issues uh, associated with uh, those issues that Ashwari's family are concerned. Obviously, any experiences with regards to SAC1 events feed into any clinical review process. That's what they're there for. That's what they're there for. Uh, so this uh, opportunity to, of, of political blame gaming that you're engaging in is actually counterproductive in relation to the SAC1 process, which is to give people absolute freedom and support and confidence that they can report where they think clinical uh, 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 delivery can be improved. And of course, it'll, the, the review will be informed by these things. The 
The member for Forestville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Police. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's unprecedented support for the Western Australian Police Force and recent comments by the Director General of ASIO regarding terrorism threat levels. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how this investment is supporting WA's police preparedness to respond to serious incidents and emergencies? And furthermore, can the Minister outline to the House how this investment will support WA Police in the work they do to protect our community? Madam the Speaker. Minister for Police. Madam Speaker, thank you and I uh, thank the member for Forestfield for his uh, question and, and also for his uh, wholehearted support for West Australian Police Force in uh, dealing with the challenges they confront. Um, the Director General of ASIO on the uh, 17th of March tabled his annual uh, threat assessment, members, and uh, it was uh, quite concerning. It confirmed that the risk of terrorist threat remains at probable. And uh, his actual statements uh, with respect to terrorism was that we have credible intelligence that individuals and groups have the capability and intent to conduct terrorism onshore. He went on to and he made it very clear that the threat is significant and it's not going away. Uh, he went on to refer to uh, those um, motivated by religious violent extremism and also the threat, the growing threat in, in uh, terms of what's termed uh, right-wing terrorism or uh, uh, ideological extremism. Uh, it's taking up investigations with respect to that side of the spectrum in, in terrorism threat is, uh, is uh, consuming some 40 per cent of ASIO's time now. So it was uh, timely that at the end of the uh, uh, a couple of weeks after that point in time, I was able to uh, visit uh, the tactical response group at their training uh, facility here in Perth and uh, have an, a, a close look at what our capability is here in Western Australia. And I've got to say, I do have first-hand experience of uh, counter-terrorism training and counter-terrorism capability. Um, like the member for Willoughby, he's in his absence, I'll acknowledge him. But, uh, um, I've got to concede that it is a little dated. Uh, I was looking at it and it's a little disturbing to note that uh, I commenced that training uh, two years before the member for Scarborough was born. So, <laughs> so my, my, knowledge, <laughs> my, my knowledge of the capability is a little dated, but does give me a benchmark. It uh, enabled me to, uh, whilst I was visiting our, uh, the wonderful uh, people that uh, are in the, the TRG out there and witnessed some of their uh, equipment and their capabilities, I was able to confirm that uh, far in excess of anything I uh, was able to employ all those years ago, um, the, it's all changed since um, we were in the t tactical um, assault group in those days, the only one in the country in the Special Air Service Regiment. Subsequent to the 9-11 uh, the, uh, attacks, there's been a massive increase in capability uh, right across the country. There's now another tag in the commandos in Sydney. Uh, and also all of the police assault groups are really well resourced and, and coordinated in their response and supported far more uh, fulsomely by the, the uh, Commonwealth and individual states and territories. And so our TRG is world class. Uh, their equipment, their capabilities, you know, they have, they have method of entry uh, capabilities that were only resident in the military when I was doing it way back when. And uh, their, uh, their weapons, um, all of their techniques are, are first class. And I just uh, wanted to take the opportunity to convey to the House and to the Western Australian public that there is a threat out there. Um, there are other threats other than COVID. And uh, this one is very real. Uh, but Western Australia is prepared. Our government has ensured that over the, over the Ford estimates, some uh, $900 million has been added to the police budget. Uh, an additional 950 police officers will be uh, put into the field. And uh, the, Madam Speaker, you ensured that our police are, are well armed in terms of legislative powers, uh, having passed uh, the Terrorism Extraordinary Powers Amendment Act and uh, the, detained terrorist, uh, the other legislation, the Terrorism Preventative Detention Amendment Act, uh, to ensure that we have every capability and law behind us necessary to respond to this threat. The uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my question today is to the Minister for Local Government. Uh, Minister, I refer to the Auditor-General's uh, report into the regulation and support of local government sector with its seven damning findings and of failures that significantly undermine the ability of local government entities to provide good government and proper services to the communities. And I ask 
Do you agree that the department has fundamentally failed in implementing good principles of good governance? Two, do you concede that as a result of these failures, organisations like Welga have been re required to pick up the slack? And three, what steps will you take to ensure those, pre ser uh, those serious issues are addressed and rectified? Good the, yeah, right. the Minister for Local Government. I, I want to thank the trading wheels off. I want to thank the uh, member for his question. Uh, the Auditor General uh, review of the agency and regulation did note one or two actually critical trends, and that was the escalation in the number of complaints in the sector. In particular, the large number or increasingly significant number of complaints, minor breaches, but it also noted a trend of major breaches. So what we're seeing is, and I think it's fair to say, we're seeing a larger number of investigations, a larger number of inquiries, uh, a sector that unfortunately I think there is general agreement has not been performing its best. Yesterday I tabled three inquiries. We now have perhaps history repeating itself, I hope not, at the City of Canning. So we need to be acutely aware that we do need reform in the sector. The Auditor General's report, and I agree with it, also noted that the, the agency needed to focus on early intervention. And I do want to get to this point. The, the department has been reactive. It's had to be because of the number of issues coming forth. We do not have an act that enables early intervention. None of us want to see inquiries. They absorb time, money, etc. What we want to enable in reforms to the Local Government Act is actually early intervention. So when problems are emerging, the minister or the agency, and we haven't worked out that model as yet, can actually send someone forth to work in the local government. So we don't even get to the inquiry. My department has accepted all the recommendations from the Auditor General. We will be working on it. But she has clearly identified bigger and broader issues which do require a change to the Local Government Act. And I want to assure you, Member, my training wheels are well off and off the ground that I am deeply focused on reforming the sector and have been engaging with a large number of local governments to date to discuss to begin that discussion. Yeah. Supplementary. Minister, why are you now repeating your predecessor's reckless and unnecessary politically based forays with all of these reckless inquiries repeatedly? Uh, in launching inquiries, which the report has outlined, has led to the department's problems. The Leader of the House. This is uh, not a supplementary question. It he's, is. He's, he's preempted. Pre oh. So, the yeah. point of order. Yes, further the minister to, further outlined to the point that he just launched three more inquiries no, no, today. That's the point of the, of the supplementary question. I didn't. So can, I, can we just hear your supplementary yeah. question so okay. that we know what we're expecting the Minister I'll, to answer? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify it. Why are you now repeating your predecessor's reckless and unnecessary forays into this endless number of politically inspired inquiries? Right. You know, the Minister for Local Government. Government. If ignorance is bliss, you must be the happiest person on earth. <laughs> address this. Yesterday, I tabled three inquiry reports. I have not called any additional inquiries. That's what I stated, and I did that yesterday in the parliament. What I put on the record today actually is I do not want further inquiries. I do accept it is a waste of money and time for everyone. Developers, stakeholders don't like it because the local government is in total disarray. Councillors and the community don't like it. What I'm proposing, and I just answered in that question, is, is that I will be looking at an alternative model that will enable early intervention so that we can avoid acquiries in the future. At the moment, under the Local Government Act, there are very limited opportunities when there is dysfunctional council. And unfortunately, an inquiry 
under the current provisions is usually what occurs, even though a minister may not want to go down that route. Now, I'm prepared to work with WALGA, with your party, because I know members in your party have had complaints about local government and CEOs, but to suggest it's some sort of political witch hunt is absolute nonsense, because I've not called one inquiry yet. That concludes question time. Sorry, Member, that concludes question time.